All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to our UHAGS workshop. Today is going to be, uh, this workshop is our third third workshop in the series. Uh, today we'll be inviting Tanmay Bakshi. Tanmay is a our applications, uh, uh, applications engineer at IBM and he is a certified Google developer engineer. Uh, so we'll wait for a little bit until he arrives here. Oh, I think he's already here. All right, how are you Tanmay? Doing very well, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, welcome to you, Hacks. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, could you start us off with a little short introduction about yourself? Definitely, glad to. So, I mean, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Once again, I'm really excited to be part of you, Hacks. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Tanmay Bakshi. I'm really excited about building technology. That's something I love to do. I've been working with the world of code ever since I was uh, around five years old. Uh, I've been working with machine learning since I was 11. Um, and apart from just building technology and, and creating what I think are really innovative applications to help people, I'm also really excited about helping more people get into the world of machine learning technology as well, which is why I love you know doing, doing workshops like this one today. I've got, you know, four technology books that I've published, my YouTube channel, and, and, and so much more. So that's that's really what I love to do. Awesome. That sounds really engaging. All right. Uh, the, the stage is yours. Go and take it away, Tammy. Sounds good. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can actually take a look at a couple uh, what, what I think are really interesting things I have to show today. Um, now, once again, basically the way this is going to work, um, I'm, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this, is we're going to start off, I'm going to show you uh, really just an introduction to the world of machine learning, why I'm so excited by it, uh, some of the things that I've done that are powered by machine learning, including some really fun applications like heart-based authentication. Um, and then from there, I'm going to show you what, uh, some more technical demos of how you can actually build uh, machine learning systems and actually implement some of the core technologies behind machine learning yourself in languages like Python. <laughs> 
Um, I'll also explore some of the interesting uh, sort of emergent behavior that machine learning systems actually demonstrate that I think are really fun to dig into. Uh, and then from there, I want to keep quite a bit of time for Q&A because I feel like that's the most interesting part. I do want to make sure that we get to your questions um, so I can help answer them. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I mean, as I mentioned uh, just really quickly, you know, my name is Tan I love building technology and also helping more people get into the world of technology through resources like my YouTube channel and the four tech books that I've published more on the way. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been working with machine learning ever since I was 11 years old, and it all started with me stumbling upon IBM Watson and how it not only played, but also won the Jeopardy game show back in 2011 against the two best human competitors on the game show. Now, when I stumbled upon this, I was immediately fascinated. And to date, I still think it is one of the most impressive applications of machine learning technology because of the sheer complexity of it, right? We're taking natural language clues that even humans have a difficult time parsing, you know, forget understanding and actually, you know, figuring out responses to. And we're, we have a computer system now that can analyze them and respond to them with high enough accuracy and, and fast enough uh, that it can compete and win against uh, professional human players, the best of the best. That really fascinated me. And ever since then, I've been digging deeper and deeper into the world of artificial intelligence technology. Um, now, personally, before we continue, uh, you, you might hear me say the word machine learning a lot, right, instead of artificial intelligence. And, and the reason is because I personally, even though I'm a fan of the technology, I'm not really a fan of the way we refer to the technology or, or to its capabilities, right? Even the wording artificial intelligence, I think, gives this technology way too much credit, right? We're, we're not actually creating intelligent systems in any way. And if anything, I feel like artificial intelligence is less of a technology term and more of a user experience term. And as a technologist, you know, that, 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 that doesn't really satisfy me, uh, right? I mean, think about like, for example, your Apple Watch, right? If you have an Apple Watch, it is consistently looking at accelerometer and gyroscope data from your wrist. And it is, you know, it is continuously making predictions as to whether or not, for example, you took a fall. And if you did take a fall, it's going to give you 60 seconds to respond or else it'll call emergency services, right? Or, or similarly, similarly, think about um, the personal assistant on your phone. Maybe you've got a smart speaker, maybe you've got you know, Siri on your phone, whatever it might be. Technically, both of these different applications that I just mentioned, fall detection and personal assistance, they're implementations of the same fundamental machine learning technology, what you might call artificial intelligence. But we only really commonly refer to one of them as AI, right? the personal assistant, because that's what we see as, you know, quote unquote, intelligent. Right. So. AI is really a user experience term, in my opinion. I personally prefer to call this technology machine learning technology. And one of the reasons that I think this is such an important technology is because of how fundamental it is, meaning it can have an impact across all kinds of domains, right? So over 72% of organizations, for example, vote machine learning as the most disruptive technology out there today. And when I saw that stat for the first time a little while ago, I had to answer why. You know, why exactly do 72% of organizations just happen to agree that machine learning is the most disruptive technology out there? And in my opinion, it's really because technology in general is infrastructure, right? And this is really important to when we actually get to implementing machine learning to remember this. It's that Technology isn't, only, it isn't just its own domain. It really is what powers all kinds of other domains and other industries, really, right? It is the infrastructure for those other fields. Uh, think about practically anything from healthcare to education, especially now during the pandemic, right? To agriculture, to entertainment, to finance, to, to all these different fields, right? They are inherently powered by technology in some way. And and you might take a look at different, you know, next generation technologies and you might see where they apply here, but some of them don't really apply here, right? Like for example, maybe you don't want to be using the cloud as much in an agriculture use case because you want to be doing predictions on the edge on actual devices. Uh, maybe you don't want to be applying blockchain as much in the entertainment industry because there aren't as many use cases. Uh, maybe IoT doesn't make as much sense in education as it might in a different domain, right? So there are limitations to where these technologies can be applied. But when you start taking a look at machine learning technology, you actually start to realize 
that, well, it can be applied basically everywhere, right? It doesn't matter what the domain is. You can apply machine learning technology quite simply because it is a universal technology. Because at the end of the day, all machine learning is, is just really fancy data analysis. Now, really fancy to be fair, but it is data analysis, right? It's enabling us to take all kinds of really vast data sets that previously would sit in an archive drawer and start to extract insights from them that we can then, you know, take action on. And with modern machine learning technology, like deep learning technology, as you're about to see, we can even start to comprehend all kinds of unstructured data instead of just structured data, which is what we were limited to before. Now we can analyze audio and images and text and so much more. Now, I've been able to do some really fun things with the power of this data analysis technology. One quick use case that I do want to show you, um, some a, a project that I'm personally really passionate about, just before we move on, is a project of mine called Hard ID. Uh, the point of Hard ID, as the name implies, is to be able to identify you based off of the way that your heart beats. I think it's a really fun use case, and there's three stages to it. Of course, the first stage is when I actually train my neural networks. The second stage is when I actually use these neural networks to extract unique features from electrocardiogram data from a set of users. And then the third phase is when this neural network can then extract new features from electrocardiogram it may have never seen before, and then try and match them against previous features seen in the, the electrocardiogram we've already registered. Right, those are the sort of three stages to this project. And what's interesting is that you can even visualize, for example, the embeddings or the internal representations of the actual heartbeat features that this neural network is able to generate. For example, if you took heartbeats from both me and my sister and fed them into the neural network and visualized the final representations as a bar graph like this, as you can see, we have two bar graphs that look very different, which Makes sense because we're two different peoples. These bar graphs should look different. That's the entire point, right? And so using these representations, we can try and identify people. Um, and these representations are calculated using deep learning technology. Now, uh, a little while ago, I actually got the chance to test out Hard ID with, with two of my friends. And they're actually kind of special because not only was Hard ID successful in, in, in distinguishing between the two of them, but they are actually sisters. They're not twins, right? they're, they're, they're two years apart. But despite the fact that they're a couple years apart, Face ID, Apple's own biometric authentication for the iPhone, actually can't tell the difference between them, right? They can fool Face ID, watch this. So I've got my friends Raquel and Simone here, right? So if Simone unlocks her phone with Face ID, of course that makes sense because her, that's her phone, but Raquel can also unlock her phone with Face ID and there's no alternate appearances set up in Face ID settings, right? So what's really fascinating to me is that even though they can trick Face ID, Hard ID works perfectly fine. So as you can see, I'm capturing a couple seconds of electrocardiogram data from Raquel, and just like that, the neural network can predict this to be Raquel. And similarly, given a couple of seconds of electrocardiogram data captured from the wrists of Simone, we get you are Simone as the prediction from this neural network. All right, so this is, this is why deep learning technology fascinates me so much. There's so much that you can do with it, all kinds of data that you can now suddenly understand computationally that previously would have been impossible to do. Right? And it's all because of, well, at least a lot of modern use cases at least, are because of what we call deep learning technology. So how about we dive into that? Deep learning is probably something you've heard a lot about. The way I like to categorize it is deep learning would be sort of like a specific subset of machine learning algorithms, which are algorithms that are commonly implemented to, ex to implement um, artificial intelligence as a user experience term, right? And deep learning in particular is exciting because it's sort of like the new frontier of machine learning algorithms. It's what's powering a lot of modern innovations in the world of machine learning, enabling us to understand all kinds of data that was, once again, previously off the table for us to be able to comprehend computationally. Uh, now, I like to sort of refer to a joke about topologists to understand how deep learning works, and you'll see why it's, why it's relevant in just a moment. Uh, the joke goes that to a topologist, a coffee mug and a donut are the same thing because they both only have a single hole. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with machine learning technology or deep learning technology? Well, let me explain. Imagine you start off with a coffee mug like this one. All right, now let's just say 
I were to draw a bunch of red and blue dots on this coffee mug in random locations, right? Completely random points all over this coffee mug. And if I were to ask you to separate between the red and the blue dots on this coffee mug with a single straight line, there's a very good chance you couldn't do it. Of course, they're random, so it's possible they could end up in just the right spots where you could do it, but there's a very good chance that they're placed chaotically enough that you could not use a single straight line to separate between the red and the blue points. In other words, the data isn't linearly separable. You can't separate it with a line. Now that's a problem, because if data is linearly separable, it's trivial to process. Right? So if you could separate them with a single straight line, it's very easy to calculate what that line should be. And so what deep learning technology enables us to do is basically say, okay, we've got the coffee mug. What if we were to warp the space on which these points are located in such a way so that the points end up in places in a new space where we can separate between them? Right, so you can think of that as almost taking like a moldable coffee mug with these points on them and physically warping the mug while keeping the topology the same in such a way that we end up with a new space where all those points can be separated by a straight line. Right? That can take a little while to sort of wrap your head around, but let me show you a real world example. This data has three different classes or categories that we want to classify between. Right, we've got the green, we've got the blue, we've got the red. I'll explain what this data is in just a moment. Now, as you can tell, it's relatively easy for us to separate between red and the other two categories because it's so far away and you could very easily draw a single straight line to classify between them. The data is linearly separable. Blue and green, on the other hand, are mostly linearly separable, but there is a little bit of overlap, right? I can imagine in my head right now, like a line going between green and blue that would have like two misclassifications, one green for blue, one blue for green, right? So it's mostly linearly separable. So if we wanted to figure out a mathematical model to take a point in this two-dimensional space and tell us which color it belongs to, it would be reasonably simple to do so. Right? It would basically be one linear transformation to figure out which um, category it belongs to. However, this is not the original data. The original data looks more like the graph on the left. As you can see, red is still very simple to distinguish, but green and blue are a lot more intertwined. A single straight line between green and blue in that space would have caused a lot of misclassifications. You could have something that approximates it, but definitely not a good separation. Now, the way that we got the graph on the right was by training a deep learning system on the data on the left to distinguish between the three different categories. And if you took the final representations of the space before the neural network came to a conclusion, you would see the data on the right. Allah, the neural network was able to figure out this linearly separable space in which to classify between the three different categories. Now, I know this was a lot to, to take in all at once, so I am going to show you a simple demonstration of the technology that enables this to happen first, gradient descent, and then we'll take a look at this actually happening in real time. Let's take a look. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a quick demo um, of a couple different um, use cases here. I want to start off with an example that I like to call the trilateration example, right? So Desmos is a website I'm certain you're familiar with. Um, and effectively, what I've got over here is a fun, little, a fun little graph, interactive graph that I put together. And it demonstrates the use case of trilateration. Now, what is trilateration, you may ask? Well, think about for a moment, how GPS works, right? How does your phone know where you are on the road? Well, what it's doing, and you may already know some of these details, but effectively what it's doing is it's communicating with different satellites that we've put up in space. Um, and it, it's, it's determining, uh, your GPS unit is determining its distance to these satellites. Now these satellites know where they are relative to the earth. And based off of the distance to these satellites, it can determine where you are. If, for example, it can your phone can figure out its distance to four different satellites, using a trilateration algorithm, it can figure out where it is on the planet because it knows where those satellites are and your phone's distance to them. Now, in reality, 
we don't actually do this because it'll be trilateration. Instead, satellites, what's no, satellites uh, for, for GPS use what's known as triangulation, which is where you figure out the angle to the satellites, then you use that to calculate it instead, but it's the same idea, right? If you can figure out your distance to four different satellites and you know where they are, then you can figure out where you are on the planet. And so what this little demonstration does is it actually shows you how you would calculate that, but this time in two dimensions. So for example, let's just say we had um, this, this, this green point in the middle here, right? This is, this is located at 2, 2 on the graph. Um, and if we wanted to figure out where this point is, I mean, in this case, we know where it is, but imagine we didn't know where it is, but we did have these other three reference points, right? We had A over here is our blue, uh, our blue point, uh, B, oh, sorry, red, <laughs> A over here is our red point, B is our blue point, um, and C is another uh, green point over here. Right, So we've got A, B, and C, and let's just say we knew the distance from A, B, and C to our goal point, which, which is where we're trying to figure out uh, we are. What we could do is we could draw circles around these points uh, with the radius of the distance from these reference points to our goal, and where these three circles intersect is where that goal is located. Right? So wherever we move this, Wherever those three circles intersect based off of their distance to that goal point, that is where the goal point is, right? However many dimensions you have in the space, add one, that's how many reference points you need. In two dimensions, you would need three reference points. In three dimensions, which is like, not, of course, the universe we live in, uh, you would need four, which is why you need four GPS satellites at the minimum to determine your location. Now. A simple way of actually calculating this would be to use like actual linear algebra <laughs> to calculate it. Um, you could use, there's certain, you know, th th there's a way to mathematically calculate uh, where this goal point would be given the distances from reference points. But I think a much more fun way of calculating it is by using what's known as gradient descent, which is basically derivative-based optimization. Now, how does derivative-based optimization play into this? Well, effectively think about it like this. Imagine you start off with some kind of guess as to where this point might be on the graph, right? So let's just say we, we were to actually put this at 2, 2 really quickly. Let's just imagine we were to do 2, 2. Uh, but imagine we said, okay, we're going to guess that the point is at 0, 0, right? Origin of the graph. What we could do is we could define a function that gives us the error of how far away we are from the goal. So we could basically say, okay, take the guess, figure out its distance, its distance to the reference points, and then match those against the distances we expected. And however far off those distances are, that's the error of our guess. Now, because this is a fully differentiable function, because we can calculate a derivative through this function with respect to um, the, the guess value, Suddenly, what we can do is use the derivative to try and minimize the output of this error function. What that would mean is that the distances we see from our guess are closer to the distances we expect from the actual goal. Meaning that if you were to optimize this function, right, for the, if you were to optimize, sorry, the goal value for this function, you would end up moving your guess towards that goal. Right? So we'd start from 0, 0, and in order to minimize the error to get the distances to match as close as possible, you would end up moving towards 2, 2. Right? Let's take a look at a quick demonstration of that. So I've got uh, a little terminal window open here, and I've got a, um, a little Python script that implements exactly this logic. And it's using the TensorFlow library. TensorFlow is a library put together by Google. I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure you've probably heard of it at some point. Um, TensorFlow enables you to write code that implements uh, effectively neural network or machine learning based operations, or even more generally, uh, algorithms that enable you to, um, to automatically differentiate through your code. Right? So for example, to be able to calculate a complex function and then automatically take your function and calculate a derivative or a gradient of it uh, without you needing to implement the gradient from scratch. 
And in this particular instance, what I've done is I've imported TensorFlow. We're converting a bunch of points to tensors, right? So for example, here, we're creating our reference points, two, 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 negative two, uh, 10, eight, negative one, six, which are the same uh, reference points we use here in Desmos. And I'm defining the distances uh, from these reference points to our goal points, right? Assuming that our goal point is two, two. And then I'm starting out with a guess of, let's just say we're starting at zero, zero. Right? And then there's this function over here that can help us figure out the distances um, of our guess to the actual reference points. This is simple Euclidean distance, straight line distance. Right? We're getting the, the, the difference of the individual axes, squaring them, getting the sum of those squared differences, and then square rooting that sum. Um, and then I'm just returning all these three distances. And then we've got the error function, or what's known as the loss function. And here all we do is we get the guess distances, we get the distances that we actually expected, which are these values over here. And then from there, we go ahead and figure out the errors from the distances we saw versus the distances we expected. And then we return the summed value of those errors. And then in order to optimize the guess, all we need to do is create what's known as a gradient tape, enabling TensorFlow to record the operations that we run. We tell TensorFlow that, hey, we want to optimize the guess value, so watch that. We then calculate the loss. We print it out just so we can see what we're dealing with. But then after that, we calculate the derivative of this loss function, right? whatever loss value we got, with respect to the guess value. And then we optimize the guess based off of that derivative. Right? We take that final derivative value, we scale it down so we don't make a, a huge jump in the space, and, and we move in the opposite direction of that gradient, of that derivative, because, of course, the derivative wants to move us um, towards a higher value in this function. But we want to go in the opposite direction. We want to minimize the loss or the error. And so we move in the opposite direction, and we continue over and over again until this loss is an acceptably small value, until we sort of reach the error margin that we're okay with. So for example, if I were to run this code over here, it's going to initialize the TensorFlow runtime. It's going to go ahead and start optimizing. As you can see, it's printing out the loss value. We started out at a huge 10 loss value, but then over time it goes down and down as we slowly converge, and eventually we end up very, very close to the point 0.22. Right? That's a simple example of what is effectively all of machine learning. Right? This is the core concept behind machine learning. It is, can we build a sufficiently complex function to which we don't really know, you know what the individual values should be necessarily, but then can we figure out what those values need to be using gradient descent? So can we, for example, build a really complex mathematical function with a bunch of random numbers in it, where we feed in an image and we expect the output to be a probability distribution of what the image contains, and then can we just figure out what the internal numbers need to be using this kind of gradient descent, right? For a simple example like this, even if I needed to manually write out the derivative function, it wouldn't really matter. It's a super simple derivative. But when you scale up to billions of numbers, writing them manually gets really, really painful. And that's where libraries like TensorFlow come in. They enable you to do things like this little construct here in Python, which if you noticed, what it's doing is it is literally looking at every individual operation you run on your numbers as you run them, right? So like for example, when you actually square these numbers, it's noting down somewhere in a graph that, hey, you squared these variables. And then when you ask for the gradient or when you ask for the derivative, it's like, okay, what was that whole computational graph? It looks at the graph and then it figures out the derivative for you, calculates it, and returns it to you. Right? That is what TensorFlow enables you to do. Of course, there's a lot more to it, but that is one of its core concepts. And by the way, all this code will be available on GitHub after this um, for you to take a look at. I will uh, probably put that in the live chat and also on the, on the Discord uh, if, you, if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, but that's that's one of the examples, right? That's that's trilateration. Uh, I would also like I would also very much encourage you to play around with a website known as the TensorFlow Playground over here. This sort of helps you understand neural networks themselves a little bit better, right? So, for example, over here. What we've got is uh, sort of like a, a, a very simple visualization of a neural network. 
effectively what the TensorFlow Playground is doing is it's letting you see the input that you're feeding into this neural network, the architecture of this neural network and the output of it as well. Right, so in this in this simple example, you've got the TensorFlow Playground giving you this simple data set where you've got a bunch of blue dots clustered over here and a bunch of orange dots clustered over here. And the point of the neural network is to draw a line in the space to make it so that we can determine where all the orange dots will be and where all the blue dots will be. All right, if I click on play, it's actually going to use gradient descent to figure out a function that can very nicely determine where that line should be to distinguish between the two different kinds of clusters. Right, so the background uh, color of this graph represents the prediction of the neural network in that area. So you can see in this area, the neural network predicts all orange. This sort of middle area is sort of like a gray area. It's well, white, if you're talking literally. Um, and, then, and then sort of after a little bit of a gradient, we see the blue area that the neural network predicts. And the way this neural network works is super simple. Effectively, all we're doing is we're feeding in the X value and the Y value of the graph, right? So if I hover over this, you can see the X value going from negative to positive. If I hover over this, you can see the Y value going from positive to negative. Um, and the way that we calculate an output uh, is we simply take these the X and Y value, multiply them by some weight, add them together to calculate the value of this sort of internal hidden state of the neural network. And then we multiply that by some weight. And then that is our final output from the neural network. Now, for some more complex kinds of data sets, you might need more individual neurons or more layers of neurons, or maybe even more data features, right? Like for example, because we're feeding in both the X and the Y coordinates into this neural network, we're able to draw a diagonal line in the space. But if I were only feeding in an X coordinate, then, well, it doesn't have a Y coordinate with which to angle that line. So it can only draw, um, it can only draw a, a straight line like this. It can't draw a diagonal, right? Or for example, if we were to deal with a data set like this one, right, where you've got these individual quadrants of orange and quadrants of, 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 of blue, simply feeding in a single feature to a single neuron like this isn't enough because you can't draw a single straight line to differentiate between the different clusters here. You need multiple individual lines and curves to be able to model this properly. So First of all, obviously I would need both features X and Y, but even that's only gonna get me so far. A single straight line, even if it's diagonal, isn't really gonna help. So suddenly I've got to do even more. For example, maybe I can add an extra neuron so we're not limited to just that one individual line. As you can see, we're doing a lot better. Maybe I could even add an extra hidden layer to make it so I can have like non-linearities, right? So I can, I can draw more advanced curves just like that, right? So, so it's, 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 when you're designing these sorts of neural networks, you've got to keep in mind sort of like the complexity of the data you're dealing with, how to structure these functions. And the idea is that these individual numbers, right, these weights between nodes in the neural networks, this deep learning algorithm, these are figured out for you by the gradient descent algorithm. That's how, that's how that works. And of course, if you have super complex functions, sometimes you really gotta scale it up and just, you know, try and try and get the try and get the computer to figure it out for you. Sometimes you gotta even do things like make it learn slower, decrease the learning rate, make it take smaller steps in that derivative space, and so on and so forth. There's all kinds of optimizations, you know, feed in different features, um, like the sign of the coordinates coordinates multiplied or even squared. Um, there's all kinds of things that can help you train neural networks better. Of course, this is synthetic data, so it's very easy for us to say, okay, let's slap another feature on there. But in real world data, this can be a lot more difficult. And that's why deep learning exists, to help, it, to help us uh, design these sorts of functions in a much simpler manner. Now, what's really interesting is that the way that these neural networks are trained enable you to extract insights from your data in almost unexpected ways, right? And I want to show you a quick demonstration of what I mean by that. Um, and to do so, I want to sort of go back to this example that I was showing you just a moment ago with the different colored dots. Uh, these dots are actually from the very famous Iris Flower data set. The Iris Flower data set is a, is a data set of 150 different rows, each row containing four attributes of a flower. 
and of an iris flower. And the idea is to be able to classify between which kind of iris flower those four attributes define. Things like petal length and sepal length and so on. And as you can see, when you sort of do some dimensionality reduction in two dimensions, two of these categories are very intermingled. Right? You cannot determine the, uh, which one is which using a single straight line. Um, and so you need a deep learning algorithm to try and figure out how to separate them intelligently. Right? Again, using the word intelligently kind of loosely there, but with, with, with a sort of nonlinear um, uh, um, function. And so what I've gone ahead and done over here is I've implemented a super simple TensorFlow script to actually train a neural network from scratch um, on the iris flower data set. So all I do is I go ahead and load in the iris data set. I convert it to the right data types. I put together a super simple neural network that goes from four features to 10 hidden states to then five hidden states to two and then finally three. Right, kind of like how you saw in the TensorFlow playground over here, we have all these different like hidden states that represent the insides of the neural network before we end up with a prediction here. Um, I go ahead and put together these different layers. And then I go ahead and create a prediction function and then a simple optimization script, kind of like how you kind of like how I did with the trilateration example. Um, and if I were to actually go ahead and run this training script, you can see uh, that it should go ahead and start optimizing. As you can see, our loss value is going down. Uh, the idea is to get this loss value as low as possible because that means it's making uh, more sort of correct classifications. Uh, once we get to an acceptably low loss value, the training script will stop. And we will actually get a new file called emb.npy. This file contains all of the internal neural network hidden states as it was training. Now, here's what's really interesting. If you take a look at the script, as you can see, just before the final prediction where we try and figure out which flower it was, because there's three different kinds of flowers, the, the layer just before that has two dimensions. And because right after that layer, we only have a single layer to make the predictions, that means that the values in this layer must be linearly separable in order for the last layer to be able to figure out which flower we're dealing with. And so, you probably know where this is going. There's two units, that means two dimensions, which is easy to visualize. They have to be linearly separable. So let's see what the neural network came up with. Let's see how it decided to represent those flowers in its internal hidden state. So if I were to go ahead and run this script here, as you can see over time, this neural network sort of is moving these points in this two dimensional space as gradient descent continues to optimize the, the sort of topology of this, of, of, this, of this space. And we see, um, or rather not topology, but uh, sort of representing uh, the values within the space. And we see that green and blue over time become more and more linearly separable, right? So if I were to run that one more time, right, we see at first they're super, you know, um, intermingled, but over time they sort of separate out further, enabling that last layer to classify between them, right? That's the kind of emergent behavior that I find incredibly fascinating. And that also enables us uh, to extract some really unique patterns. So for example, um, if you take a look at one of the more popular image classification neural networks out there, right? That's a, that's a classic use case is image classification. Uh, effectively, the way that's working is it's taking a bunch of different visual you know, uh, feature extraction layers, convolutional layers is what they're called. Um, and it is, and I can actually show you a little visualization here. It, it's feeding into one of these final linear layers, as we like to call them, or, or dense layers, as, as, as TensorFlow likes to call them. And then it's, it's, it's using that last layer as a probability distribution of what uh, is in the image, right? So for example, if we had a super simple dog cat classification network, you would take the image, you would feed it into this really large neural network that would extract features. And then you've got that final layer at the end that's responsible for giving you the probabilities of the different classes that you expect. And once again, just like always, if you take a look at the actual gradient descent procedure, you effectively end up sort of embedding the image into a high dimensional space where the different categories are linearly separable from one another for the last layer to be able to determine its class. And what's, what's, what's interesting about the way that this works is that images that are closer together in that embedding space can be assumed to be similar to each other. And so think about this, each of the nodes that represent one of the probabilities for a class in that final linear layer, if you take a look at their weights, 
theoretically, classes that look similar visually should have similar weights because they're going to have similar places in the embedding space that they're coming from. Right? Like if you were to take a look at two different dogs, right? If you had a really large neural network and a couple of its classes were dogs, then theoretically all the dogs should be pretty close together in that embedding space, but still linearly separable from each other because the last layer needs that. And so all the dog probability nodes at the very last layer should have similar weights coming in from the embedding space because they're all dogs, but they should all still be different because of course you need to tell between them. And so in order to demonstrate that phenomenon, I've put together a little bit of a demonstration here. Uh, and this Python script, what it's going to do is it's going to load in a neural network called Convnext by Facebook or Meta, I guess. Um, as you can see, it has 392 million parameters, right? What we were dealing with in the TensorFlow playground is child's play compared to the sheer scale of this neural network. And if we go ahead and look at just the weights of the last layer, and we take a look at all the different classes this neural network was trained on, of which there are 21,843. Theoretically, I should be able to give my script any one of these classes, and it'll tell me which of the other classes are most similar to this neural network based off of the weights that go from the penultimate layer to, well, the ultimate, the last layer. So for example, if I were to take um, the, uh, the identifier for soil dirt, and if I were to feed that into my script here, it says the input class is soil dirt. And you can see that the output class is classes that look similar to soil and dirt it would be battlefront or cigarette butt or ash can or garbage landfall and so on and so forth. If I were to look for, for example, a husky dog or an Eskimo dog and feed in that um, identifier, it gives me things like Siberian Husky, sled dog, Malamute, dog sled, and so on and so forth. All right, it's because all these different classes are activating similar portions of the neural network, therefore resulting in similar locations in the embedding space, enabling us to find these kinds of patterns that emerge. And once again, this neural network was never trained to do this. Right, the neural network was never trained specifically being told, you know, um, huskies and Siberian huskies and sled dogs have similar features. All it was given was, here's a bunch of images, here's the final probabilities that we expect, which would be, you know, which image it is. And it ended up learning these patterns just based off of the distribution of data that was fed into it during the optimization phase. Um, now, there's all kinds of ways that you could train neural networks. And I do want to make sure that I can, I can get to your questions and sort of, because I know there's been a lot of stuff that I've just covered now. Um, and so there is one more pattern that I do want to cover really quickly. And it has to do with the way that language is structured. This is something that I personally find incredibly fascinating. And it is to do with the world of natural language processing. Now, there's one really popular neural network architecture out there. It's called BERT. Effectively, the way that it's trained is by using fill in the blanks. So you'll give it a sentence uh, like, for example, uh, the fire truck is blank in color or tomorrow's blank forecast calls for blank and wind, right? And the neural network is going to uh, predict what these fill in the blanks should be, right? What, what are the words that were removed from the original sentence? And by doing just this super simple fill in the blank task, the neural network ends up learning very useful representations of a language internally. And then you can use this neural network later downstream on different tasks to do practically any kind of natural language processing you want. Um, and here is what's absolutely mind boggling to me. You probably know that language can be structured in syntax trees like this, right? So given a sentence, you can figure out all its different components and how they connect in a tree structure. Now, these are syntax trees that we've put together to help us understand language better, right? This is not how language originated, right? Humans, you know, many, many thousands of years ago didn't sit around figuring out how to structure language. We invented language, syntax trees came after that. It's an invention that we put on top of language to help us structure and understand it better. Here's the thing. BERT, the neural network, trained only on fill in the blanks. That's all. If you take a look at its weights internally, it ends up inherently learning through gradient descent 
how to structure natural language in effectively the same syntax trees that we use. So if you were to, for example, represent a syntax tree as a bunch of words and their depth inside of a syntax tree, right? So for example, in this case, the y-axis would be the depth of a word in the syntax tree and the x-axis would be which word it is in the sentence. If you were to represent it that way, and if you were to try and calculate these depths given nothing but the internal representations of words inside of the BERT neural network, you would end up with a graph like this one. The green, which are the probed or predicted depths from the neural network, almost perfectly match up with the actual representations of the words in the syntax trees. Right? This is proof of neural networks learning something that we invented that we thought was a useful tool just inherently because it was useful. And to me, that is incredibly satisfying to see because it almost proves the almost mathematical, uh, the fact that it's almost mathematically optimal for us to be structuring natural language the way that we do. Right. Uh, this is why this technology really fascinates me. Once again, all of this code and actually a couple more examples will be available on GitHub for you to play around with. Uh, hopefully, I've been able to show you a couple of different examples of, of, of machine learning technology that I think are, 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 are pretty incredible. And now I'd love to go ahead and answer any more specific questions you might have or anything that you'd like to see. Uh, I'd be glad to go ahead and do that. Thank you so much, Tanmay. That was really engaging. It was really interesting. Um, it's a lot of questions here on the chat. I'm not sure if we can go through all of them, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly try. And we still have Absolutely. a lot of um, questions that we uh, had before the interview uh, the uh, event, but we'll try to go through them. Sure. So are the heat, you mentioned that uh, you used um, the two different people's heartbeats to determine if there are two different people. Are the heartbeats unique to, uh, unique to everyone, like fingerprints? There have been a lot of studies done on this, and from a lot of the studies done, they are quite unique. Um, they, they've been able to determine with um, up to a, I believe, a 99% precision rate, um, the difference between up to a couple thousand different volunteers in certain studies, um, and that's where all this data comes from, right? So the neural network is trained on something like 140 different participants, and then it can be applied to anybody because now it knows how to extract features from heartbeats. But yes, they are uniquely identifiable. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, are there any fields that you think machine learning could be used, but yet isn't? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, I would say that we've applied machine learning in a lot of fields, even ones that we haven't directly applied them in, right? Like even if, for example, and I was actually on, a, on another panel a little while ago where um, folks were talking about how small businesses aren't making use of like artificial intelligence, machine learning technology that much in, in Canada specifically, for example. Um, and uh, one of the things that we brought up was the fact that, you know, you might not be realizing it, but they probably are using that technology, right? If they're using a personal assistant to make their business, you know, easier to run, like if they're help, having Siri help manage their calendar or something like that, they probably are using that technology. So just because of the prevalence of this technology, I don't think I'd be able to name a field where we're not using it. But I can say that there are certain fields where we're not using it enough or we could be using it more. Um, those would be fields like healthcare and education primarily. I think the, um, the, the requirement of security and privacy, which is not something I'm arguing, I'm just saying is something that's there in a field like healthcare, um, is something that really holds back a lot of the machine learning use cases there. Um, and in education, that field just moves so slowly that while we could be applying a lot of ML, we currently aren't. Um, and so I would say those are two fields where I think we need to be applying a lot more of it. One of my friends is really passionate about applying it in agriculture, uh, which I think is also a really fun use case. So I would say because of the sheer prevalence, I actually cannot name a field where we aren't using it, at least that I'm aware of. Um, but uh, and of course, that could also just be biased because, again, I'm, I'm a machine learning guy. I only know really about fields that, where we are using it. Um, but I would say that it's really about scaling up our usage and making it more useful rather than finding new fields to apply it in. I can take a look at more questions. Um, I'm not sure if you're coming back, but uh, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> no so I have to put my mask back on. No but worries. the next question is, um, are there any other algorithms that other than gradient descent that are used widely? 
because um, it's really used a lot. It seems like it's used a, a lot in different fields. It seems like almost it's like it's um, overused a little bit. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, no, gradient descent before it was popular. I remember Jeffrey Hinton, who um, who's at the University of Toronto and I believe also works for Google now. Um, he was sort of like the main you know, proponent of like, hey, let's use gradient descent based optimization for neural networks. And he was, you know, almost ridiculed for it. Like for the longest time, people didn't really believe that this could scale as well as it does currently. Um, and eventually when AlexNet was submitted to ImageNet and like these, these sorts of first neural networks popped up, it was huge. And now I would say the vast majority of machine learning done uses gradient descent. There are other kinds of optimization. Some of them will use like second order like Newtonian optimization, um, although that's much, much rarer. You barely ever see that because it's just a lot more unstable um, and because gradient descent just works so well. But then again, there are some cases where you can't do that. Like for example, what if you can't calculate a derivative? What if it doesn't make sense to? Right, like what if you're dealing with data where you're like trying to get a neural network to play a game and it doesn't really make sense to calculate a derivative through game logic, right? Then in that case, you would want to implement derivative free optimization using maybe particle swarm optimization. There's an algorithm called CMAES, uh, covariance matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy, mouthful. But uh, you know, these sorts of algorithms enable you to do optimization on a function without needing gradient descent, right? They're, they're implementations of reinforcement learning. Um, so it is possible, uh, but the vast majority of actual business use cases today use gradient descent. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, our next question comes from uh, actually from our one of our uh, community leads, Steve. Mm -hmm. In the previous example on Desmos, could we come up with a linear equation to improve our guesses? That is a good question. I assume we could. So. I, the way that I'm interpreting your question, uh, just and, and let me know if, if I'm not getting this right, but the way I'm interpreting your question is in order to um, start off with a better guess, could we take the reference points and the distances that we have and start off in a place that is closer to our final point and then optimize from there? If you're asking about that, in the specific trilateration example, I'm assuming there would be a way um, to do something like that. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but for neural networks and more complex machine learning algorithms, it's a lot harder. Usually we just do random initialization, right? Because there's so many between millions to potentially billions of parameters that you can't optimize for figuring out where to start. To be fair, that is a big drawback to the way that neural networks work today. Just before actually this workshop, I was testing out the Iris demo and I ran it twice. And both times it actually did not converge. It sort of just plateaued at a certain loss value and, and stopped, right? So because of this sort of random initialization, you can end up with you know, times when your neural network logic works, but you just started off with bad initialization and suddenly you're stuck in a local minimum, right? These are problems. We have all kinds of workarounds and hacks like advanced optimizers that explore and things like that um, instead of simple gradient descent. Um, but uh, unfortunately for, for more advanced machine learning and deep learning algorithms, we don't have an actual reliable solution for that yet. There, of course, there's hacks and workarounds, but nothing reliable. But yeah, I assume for, for simple trilateration, I, I imagine there should be a way. Awesome, thank you so much. I, Steve, I hope that, uh, that answered your question. Uh, I think we have room for one more last question. Um, this one comes from uh, one of our present questions. Are there any categories of data in machine learning that uh, machine learning have a lot of difficulty in differentiating? That's kind of high level uh, as, 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 as a question, but I will say that when you're dealing with limited data sets that have noise in them. That is something that machine learning really struggles, or deep learning in particular actually really struggles with. If you're dealing with a small data set where you don't have many um, data points for the, for the algorithm to work with, um, or you have lots of noise in those data points, you're gonna end up with a neural network that doesn't actually work that well. Um, perfect example is, you know, there, there's actually one more sample you'll be able to take a look at the GitHub page that I'm talking about. Um, and the sample is a simple, you know, uh, algorithm to classify between different dog breeds, 120 of them. Uh, and if you, you can actually choose how many images you feed into the neural network um, at once. Um, and and it really, if, if, you, if you scale down to something like 10 images per category, suddenly the neural network doesn't perform well at all because it just starts memorizing the individual images instead of actually trying to learn the patterns between uh, the, the, the different clusters. So while I wouldn't say a specific category of data really gives machine learning a hard time, I would say whenever you have a category of data where you're not able to find enough individual data points 
or those data points are you know really noisy in the sense that uh, you might have mislabeled uh, examples or, or you might have uh, quite literally extra stochastic noise added to the samples that is when machine learning uh, algorithms get confused right perfect example is speech to text algorithms where the audio is noisy Neural networks don't like that, which is why occasionally you'll actually have two separate neural networks, one to denoise and one to then take that denoised audio and run speech to text on it, right? because you want to be able to separate those tasks. Um, so I would say it really depends uh, on the on, on on the use case. Do we have time for any more questions? All right, thank you so much, uh, Tenme. Right. Um, I think that's a, I think we just ran out of time, but thank you so much for coming in. Um, before we let you go, is it possible for you to put a link your GitHub a link in the in the chat so that the people who are watching this later can uh, check it out? Absolutely. Give me one moment to put the link in. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and do that. Wonderful. One moment. Uh... Of course, GitHub wants to be annoying, right? As I got a get a link. <laughs> All right, that's uploading. Uh, I'll give that a, a minute to, to upload, and then I'll go ahead and put the link in. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming in, Tammy. Glad to be here. Thank again. And, uh, and if you guys have any questions, please do leave your questions in our Discord channel. Um, it'll all be there for Tammy to read, and then he can answer your questions. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming in. Uh, please join us for our next workshop at 6 PM with, uh, for, with uh, Daman China from Amazon. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next uh, workshop. Bye-bye.